Morena Tato, welcome to our webinar. And um, let us start off with a karakia before I'll give a brief overview of uh, our um, webinar. Faya te mataranga kia marama, kia fai take namahi katoa, tu maya tu kaha, arua atu, arua mai, tatu i a tatu katoa. This is in summary, seek knowledge for understanding, have purpose in all that you do, stand tall, be strong, let us show respect for each other. So again, a well, warm welcome to our um, participants and our panelists. Um, we um, have three panelists in the room today. And um, I will briefly introduce them by name before they will um, start um, and talk about um, their opinions, their stance. But um, first of all, uh, let us look at uh, what we're going to do today. So we really have um, all been probably a bit um, overwhelmed with uh, more messages about artificial intelligence. So really, um, by the end of 2022, um, web um, tech GPT has really come to the, to the prominence. Um, although artificial intelligence has been around for quite a long time, as we briefly chatted about um, earlier. So what we wanted to do today is really look at um, what this rise of artificial intelligence um, does mean for education. Um, we are seeing more and more artificial intelligent, intelligence tools coming um, you know, on board with more capabilities and there are real possibilities to make life easier and, and help um, in productivity and really um, look at in advancing what we can do as people. However, there are real challenges and um, concerns about what this all means. And our panelists um, will, show, will share their thoughts um, about um, challenges and strategies and where they stand, how, how they're using artificial intelligence and what strategies um, they share with their students. So they come from different areas of the education sector, and they um, all have a perspective on um, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and decolonization, which they will include um, in, this, um, in this hour in their presentations. We have um, Shannon O'Connor in the room and Truman Thumb. And we have um, Dr. Mark McConnell as well here with us. Uh, unfortunately, Evo um, couldn't join us. And we have a recording of uh, Rebecca Moroni as well, who is at the moment in transit on the airport. Um, so we have a slightly smaller uh, panel for our session, but I'm sure um, we will have a lot uh, to discuss and chat about. And of course, there will be space for your questions um, at the end as well. So um, to start us off, um, I uh, wanted to ask Shannon, would you um, like to be the first person, person to, to start and present? Um, Shannon, um, as a background um, at the Mind Lab, and um, she is a board member of the Maori Tech Association. Um, she has a background in both technology and education. Um, she's the founder and director of Tonui Kolep, a charitable trust in Te, te Tarafiti, committed to creating equitable STEM learning opportunities for Rangatai. So she's really interested in engaging with community partners, schools, Kura, Marae, to engage learners in the diversity and intersection of science and technology, engineering, maths, and Mataranga Māori. Um, Shannon, I would leave it there if you wanted to um, start your, your presentation. We've given everybody uh, five to seven minutes to um, present their thoughts. And uh, we really look forward um, to your points, Shannon. Mm -hmm. 
kei tūranga nui a kiwa hau, kei tōnu i kou lea bahau e mahi ana. Uh, hello Koto. my name is Shannon O'Connor and I live in Gisborne and as Bettina shared, I'm the director of Tōnui Co-Lab. I'm also a member of the EdTech NZ Council and a trustee of Te Matarau, the Māori Tech Association and a contributing member of DECA, the Digital Equity Coalition of Aotearoa. Um, as Bettina shared at Tōnui Co-Lab, we're committed to introducing and supporting our rangatahi to explore the diversity and intersection of STEM, Indigenous knowledge sharing and the opportunity for Indigenous prosperity. And this COPAP is important because of the digital inequity that currently exists across Aotearoa um, that disproportionately affects Māori. This COPAP is also important because Māori are underrepresented in STEM industries, and specifically for this corridor, the tech industry. And that's a missed opportunity for the world to benefit from our contributions and for our people to benefit from working in roles that are high paying and that provide employees with flexible, hybrid working environments. So in preparation for um, thinking about this discussion, um, I was thinking about the work we do in the Tairawhiti. So Tonui Co Labs HQ is in Tūranga or Gisborne, but we practice a mobile operation that sees us engaging with Tamariki all around the East, Co East Cape to Farikahika or Hicks Bay. Um, and this is usually a 2.5 to three hour drive, but with the impact of weather conditions such as Cyclone Gabriel, that we had earlier this year, our whānau have been isolated. And so engaging online has really been the only way to create equitable access to learning opportunities. I think if we think back to the last few years and the impact of COVID, we were already adopting flexible online learning programs. Um, we developed them during the lockdowns and continued because we'd established um, a growing community online who wanted to develop digital skills outside of their traditional learning model. When I'm thinking about the impact that I, um, AI has on both the learners and our team, I'm interested uh, in both the positive um, and I'm also concerned about the risks. Um, the opportunity that AI presents us with to personalise the learning experiences, to provide immediate and specific feedback is exciting. However, there are obvious and valid concerns about how the use of AI tools such as ChatGPT, um, are being used to disrupt the present assessment practices by some of our schools. Um, some of our students are utilising AI tools to write reports or essays, and um, depending on the depth of knowledge held by the students and their efforts to fact check the outputs that come out of ChatGPT, their submissions are potentially peppered with hallucinations. Um, and this is all happening so rapidly that I think it's put our education system on the back foot um, and we're seeing some really exciting responses where schools are being agile um, and changing their assessment practices and other situations where people are panicking. Um, when I think about the impact of AI online, uh, on online and flexible and distance learning, um, especially from the angle of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging and decolonisation, I suggest that first we need to address the digital inequity that disproportionately affects Māori and how an inability to access online learning or rapidly adopt flexible learning due to either a lack of digital devices or connectivity is the fundamental first step. But once we address and recognise the digital inequity, we can look at how AI specifically impacts us as individuals and collectively. On a positive note, it's exciting that um, AI tools can be used to make the learning content more inclusive. And so I think we can look at examples where we have real time captioning for spoken content or audio descriptions for video content. Um, and this enables learners with disabilities to fully engage. However, it would be remiss to not also consider the threat of ongoing colonisation from AI tools. Um, when we look at the early development of AI tools, we can observe that minimal Indigenous perspectives have been taken into consideration, and this will result in bias and um, racism against minorities, against Indigenous peoples, um, against Māori. Um, I think about currently the practices of use of AI and how this might be um, present risks and um, many of us have played around with ChatGPT and looked at the hallucinations that might lead to 
false narratives, the impact that might have if it's giving false whakapapa in iwi history um, from an education perspective is, is highly threatening. Um, and I start to think about the critical thinking that's required both by our educators and by our students. Um, and we're talking about belonging, but sometimes this digital environment threatens belonging and threatens connectivity. Um, I, I want to use this opportunity to actually highlight the work of um, other people. So I look to Dr. Karatiana Tairu and on the um, and his research on the impact of AI on Māori data sovereignty. Um, he's written previously, and I told Toko his widow that AI developers need to co-govern, co-design, and co-manage with Indigenous people. And Aotearoa Māori need to be part of the creation and the management of AI tools so that data and maturanga is treated like the tonga it is. Um, I think that um, I want to close off my, my opening statement by highlighting that there's many amazing people in our community doing great work. Um, there is some amazing opportunities for AI in education, um, but I want to mahi specifically to Indigenous tech leaders that are helping to navigate these pro progressions. Nga mahi. Kia ora, Shannon. Thank you so much. And thank you for um, adding your, um, you know, your um, details about the trust and your background. Um, I really appreciate it. I think what we're going to do is we'll, we'll move on to our next panelists and then give a bit of space at the end for everybody to share their questions. Please put your questions in the chat and we will try and pick them up as we go. And and um, I know Shannon, that you being the first will be really mindful going back in the chat and looking for questions. Um, but thank you, that was very, very helpful and enlightening. Mr. Mark McConnell, would you like to go? <laughs> so Mark Connell, uh, Dr. Mark Connell works at the um, commercial law section at the University of Auckland, he's a professional teaching fellow. Um, he also serves at the department's, um, he's the director of teaching and learning at the Auckland Business School. He's been involved in research projects relating to learning analytics to inform learning design and learning through the use of video tutorials. And Mark has been leading his department's response to the student use of AI tools such, such as ChatGPT. So he's been really working um, with students in the last six months or so, right, um, to uh, work out strategies of how to use it in their learning to help them also with their start in the workplace. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Kia ora koutou. Um, morena, everyone. Um, yes, I'm just going to share my screen uh, because I've got um, just a hopefully a quick PowerPoint presentation here. Um, should be sharing it now. Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> the way that I've been thinking about at least my presentation here is reflections from a frontline university teacher. I think it's great that we've got different panelists coming from different sectors um, of education and involved in education in different ways. So, you know, I'm coming from the, the university perspective here. Um, so I head up our teaching and learning um, committee, um, just within our department of commercial law within the business school. And um, so we've been just grappling basically with the realities of AI and, and particularly chat uh, GPT. It's a complex issue, I think both practically and philosophically as well. And I'm just gonna be focusing on uh, the practical realities because that's what we have been doing the last couple of, um, last couple of months actually. So <clears throat> at the University of Auckland, and this has really been because of, of COVID, all our exams are, are well, 95% of our exams, I guess, are now, are now online. Um, so we have, we have this online reality that we have to deal with. Uh, most uh, student assessments um, are also open book and they are submitted online as well. And the university has told us we are not going back to pen and paper. Mm. Um, 
So um, the big question for us, just in terms of how AI impacts our work uh, with learners and, and students is basically we, we have to just deal with the reality of, of, of students using AI and particularly we're thinking of chat GPT. Um, and so big, the, the immediate question for us is, is how do we ensure uh, that assessments are an opportunity for students to demonstrate uh, the use and application of their own knowledge and skills? So a student might be able to produce chat, B, chat GPT answer solution, but does the student have the knowledge and skills to assess how good that answer or that solution actually is? Um, so before our semester started at the end of February, uh, we kind of we are, we're all facing the reality of ChatGPT, and one of the things that I did was gathered our department together, um, all our teaching staff, and I asked everybody to put their assessment questions through ChatGPT. We shared it online, and then we had a workshop together, and we shared the results of what we found. And um, basically what we found was that um, ChatGPT scored very well in some of our first year university uh, assessments, um, sometimes scoring A's or, or high B's, um, stage two or second year courses. Um, sometimes ChatGPT could get a borderline pass. Um, it was able to handle like uh, super complex, complex factual scenarios. It could handle the facts. But um, when it came to <clears throat> some of the, the kind of more high level legal concepts, it, it did get a bit confused. Um, there's the hallucinations. Uh, Chat GPT is absolutely great at making up legal cases with full legal citations, but they are completely fictional. Um, even good at making up pieces of legislation and quoting these pieces of legislation completely made up. Um, the other thing that we uh, seem to notice was that if we asked ChatGPT um, a question and then asked the same question a couple of months later, it seemed to have improved in its answer, which was um, slightly scary um, for us. Um, so these were just some of the realities uh, that we discovered. So in terms of our response as a department, uh, we thought we needed to develop a policy for student use. Uh, we made a commitment that we had to run all our assessments uh, questions through ChatGPT and adjust and adapt accordingly. And then we also made a commitment to basically share creative ways of dealing with this new context that we find ourselves in. So <clears throat> I thought I would just share a bit about um, our student policy. Um, so at the moment, University of Auckland uh, doesn't have a particular policy. Um, so ChatBeat GPT can be uh, 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 banned or it can be permitted or it can be used by students with acknowledgement. Um, so there's some issues. We had a, we had a good discussion um, as a department about the banning. Uh, there's particular issues about banning student use of AI tools like ChatGPT. Detection tools are not 100% accurate. There's false positives. How would we police the policy? In some of our courses, we have over a thousand students. Um, so how, uh, how would we even investigate, you know, if let's say 25% of our students were using uh, ChatGPT? Students will be using AI in the real world. And uh, just that final point there, it doesn't help with the development of students' intellect, intellectual discernment abilities with regard to the use of um, AI tools. So we decided not to ban. Um, so <clears throat> we, we, this, this is, I'll just give you a snippet of our um, policy here. Um, this is, and this is just the Department of Commercial Law at Business School at the University of Auckland. Um, so we are saying students are not prohibited um, from using chat GPT or other similar AI tools for open book tests and assignment for this course, and they'll not be penalized for doing so. However, it's important for students to be aware of the potential risks and limitations of such tools. And so we've given some guidelines. <laughs> so this is number one, use at your own risk. Students who choose to use ChatGPT and other AI tools do so at their own risk. The Department of Commercial Law staff have tested ChatGPT 
found that some or all of the answers generated for commercial law assignments, assessments are often incorrect or irrelevant and can include made up cases or legislation. So we just may uh, use at your own risk. And then in terms of factual accuracy, um, uh, students need to understand that chat GPT will make things up. And therefore, it's the responsibility of students to verify the accuracy of every part of their answer, especially if the answer includes information produced by ChatGPT. So we're basically kind of saying we're going to be bringing in negative marking here. So if you want to use it, you definitely need to know um, what the risks are and take the responsibility for your use of uh, ChatGPT. And we also had a statement about academic integrity and also a statement about there's no expectation actually to, to use it here. Um, a couple of strategies, um, uh, to, at least in my mind, two different ways to deal with the reality. One is to make it more difficult for chat GPT to answer assessment questions. And there's a number of ways that you can make it more difficult. But I think there's a second strategy and that's to integrate chat GPT into your assessment questions. So for example, give students a problem scenario Give them the chat GPT answer with known inaccuracies or incomplete understanding and ask them to evaluate. So that's one way. Um, another example would be to give a set of MCQs and you know that half of it, uh, you know that, oh, and give them chat GPT's answers and you know that half of the answers are actually wrong. Ask chat GPT to give the explanation of the chat GPT answer and then ask students to evaluate which ones are actually correct. But the students don't know which ones are correct or incorrect. Um, and I think here uh, this is a potential positive because we're not just getting students to uh, to uh, give the correct answer, but we're also getting them into this kind of critical thinking, into this evaluation of the AI tool answer as well. So there's these two strategies, making it more difficult for ChatGPT to answer or integrating ChatGPT into the way that we're actually doing assessments. Um, I can say but I will stop there. I mean, no, no, you have 30 seconds, <laughs> sorry. Cool, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Apologies for the for the ending. Um, thank you for the for the examples, the strategies and, and sharing um, what you've been doing um, at the business school um, with your colleagues. Next up, we have um, Dr. Truman Pham. Um, he is the postgraduate director at Academy, Academy EX, sorry, previously the Mind Lab. He also teaches and supervises the blended hybrid master of contemporary education. Um, he currently researches areas uh, such as applications of artificial intelligence in education. And uh, he looks at um, teachers, teachers identification of leadership. He is um, currently a member of the Executive Council of EdTech New Zealand and really has um, research interest in industrial intelligence control that goes back um, um, to his um, PhD. Thank you very much, um, Truman. Thank you, Bettina. Hello, everyone. Um, right, so uh, how is my work relevant to online? Um, from the introduction of Patina, you can hear that um, I'm teaching and supervising in a, an online and planned master program. So this program helps uh, educators such as uh, teachers, lecturers to bring technology into uh, classrooms. Uh, teachers who learn with us uh, attend uh, bi-weekly sections online and meet their advisors and supervisors online for support. Uh, however, however, not everything is online. Uh, during the school holiday, uh, we have uh, hybrid colloquia, which are the workshops, and that happen uh, physically in our office and online at the same time, so people can interact. Uh, either they are uh, on site or online. Um, online and blended learning has been at the heart of teaching and learning 
uh, of Academy EX for many years. Uh, we provide flexible learning to people. So learners can learn with us anytime, anywhere, uh, either completely online or in blended learning. Right, how does AI uh, impact on my work? Um, technologies and their impact on teaching and learning have always been a core part of our program. Uh, we have actively discussed with the learners about new emerging and disruptive technologies and how these technologies uh, would impact their practice in their particular context. Uh, examples of these technologies are cloud computing, augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, and uh, AI. Um, in the online section of the workshops, uh, we discussed uh, the benefits, the risks, and the challenges of technologies, and also the frameworks or the strategies to integrate them into the teaching and learning effectively. So these discussions have the learner to be informed about and prepare for the new technologies which could be available soon. Right, in terms of research, we have done research on sentiment analysis of students' online uh, interactions uh, so that we can understand uh, more about how they feel about learning or assessments uh, to support them more effectively. Uh, we use natural language processing on Google Platform for this research. Right, uh, how my AI impact online flexible or this distant learning from the angle of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and decolonization. Uh, the new technologies come into our life, work, and learning all the time. We won't be able to stop them, right? Uh, however, we need to use them in a responsible way and mitigate all the risks associated with the new, uh, the new technologies. Uh, on a positive note, uh, for example, AI can help us to understand the interaction in the community at the workplace in terms of cultures, right? So we, we can understand more how people from different cultures interact with each other. AI can also help us to measure the inclusion. It could be easier to measure the diversity, right? But it's not so easy to, to quantify uh, the inclusion, how, inclusion, how inclusive is a company is or a school is, right? However, uh, you can probably hear about uh, a lot of problems uh, even uh, before generating AI. We have issues with diversity, equity, and inclusion in digital technology, such as digital divide, where some people have uh, access to internet all the time, everywhere, and some other people don't. Uh, so now with uh, generated AI, uh, the problem could get worse if we don't have the proper solutions or address them in a timely manner. The problem uh, of AI could be uh, racial and gender bias in the AI algorithm, data privacy, and data sovereignty. Uh, I wish use AI in digital space. Uh, most of the problems of AI would also happen in online learning. Additionally, in education, we also need to maintain academic integrity, right? When AI uh, tools are widely used. So to deal with uh, bi bias in algorithm, uh, I think diversity, inclusion, and transparency should be included throughout the entire life cycle of AI software development, from ideation, to design, to development, to deployment, post-launch monitoring, and especially in customer support. To deal with uh, all the problems of AI in online learning, we really need a holistic and people-centric approach from innovative ways of teaching and learning, proper and diverse assessments for learning, for both um, and to develop um, digital literacy, digital fluency, um, digital citizenship, and now AI literacy for both teachers and students. Uh, we have been doing some of this uh, before, but they are now even more important. And to, to end uh, my speech, I would like to, I, I think that uh, more support and training should be provided uh, 
uh, to improve AI literacy of people from Maori and Pacific backgrounds, people from ethnic minorities, uh, people with uh, disabilities, and people in low socioeconomic status. Thank you very much. Thank you, Truman. And um, let's uh, move on to our um, last panelist who we um, have as a recording because um, as we said earlier, she's in um, transit at the airport um, somewhere in America, I believe. And this is um, Rebecca Moroni, Dr. Rebecca Moroni from um, the University of South Australia. Uh, is a lecturer in learning sciences and development for the Center of Change and Complexity in Learning um, in um, the um, uh, University of South Australia Education Futures. Her research is primarily in the fields of creativity, educational psychology, and human and artificial cognition across varying educational contexts. Um, she serves on the organizing committee for empowering learners for the Age of AI conference and also of the first international conference on change and complexity in learning. So I will just um, start her um, short presentation that she made for us and share just in case this could happen. And um, then we'll come back to our panelists. Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Rebecca Maroney. I'm a lecturer here at the University of South Australia. Um, I have a background as an educational psychologist and I currently work within the Centre for Change and Complexity in Learning at UniSA. So um, this is within the education department at the university. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about the role that AI is having um, on us as a university and on my role as a, um, a lecturer here, as well as how we're using AI or the impact that AI can have on student and staff well-being. So for a little bit of context, I work in um, the K-12 space and we're doing some work um, on how students are perceiving AI, how we can use um, artificial intelligence to reduce teacher workload, you know, through um, helping with marking and assessment, lesson planning, and in turn freeing up teacher time um, to support well-being. And that's what we're also doing um, at the university and in, in some of my courses we're piloting this year and next year. Um, how we can use artificial intelligence to kind of support our staff. Um, so this is the tutors, as well as our students that are coming through um, and getting ready to be, to enter into classrooms as teachers. So at the university, we have a mix of students. We have international, national, um, so international domestic students. We have those that um, uh engage online um, to a flexible or distance learners as well as those that come onto campus and AI is already impacting what we're doing um, with these learn with these learners in a number of areas. So one main area is around um, personalized feedback um, and personalized assessment. So next year we're going to be trialing um, in one of my courses, adaptive assessment and using AI to support this. So as students move through the course, um, it'll look slightly different for each student. So as a hypothetical example, um, the course that I teach is around theories of learning. So we introduce students to concepts and theorists such as Bandura, Vygotsky and so forth. Um, and so as students kind of move through and move through, say, this week's content on Vygotsky, uh, they have opportunities to demonstrate their knowledge through our Learn Online platform. So this could be through forum posts, discussion interactions, um, minutes watching the lecture, questions they ask, how they're engaging in the, with the tutorial materials, um, if they're online students and, and so forth. And so if they've demonstrated a competent level of understanding, and this could be uh, determined by an AI agent, and we'll have to set the criteria of what that looks like um, to see if they're competent or understanding the concept, then their assignment does not reflect the knowledge that they already know. So what we're saying is if you've demonstrated that back in week four, you understood Vygotsky to an adequate level, um, your assignment is now going to look different. 
Whereas if you didn't understand Vygotsky, then we're going to give you another opportunity um, to demonstrate this. And this is going to be probably through an assessment, uh, a formative assessment or a summative assessment. And so the idea here is that we're trying to make learning equitable and diverse for, for everybody. So it'll be flexible um, and will change according to student needs. Now, I know that in a regular classroom, um, differentiating the curriculum is quite a challenge, but when we've got, you know, 500 students, it's near impossible um, without some additional support. Um, and AI has kind of provided an opportunity for us to harness this and leverage, um, leverage the capabilities. There are some obvious ethical concerns around data privacy, um, but we have a really smart team of data scientists within the centre that I work for um, who will be creating these kind of chatbots in-house. So what this means is that our data will be stored and student data will be stored within our university system, so it won't be leaving. So in the same way that we have students uploading assignments um, through our Learn Online, um, engaging with our forum posts, and I can see their clicks and their logins, the AI agent is just going to be reading this information and feeding it back to the student or making suggestions um, onto how that we can better support these students. So this is one, going to help our students because it's flexible, dynamic, um, learning and we're going to give them multiple opportunities to demonstrate competencies or capabilities. And so hopefully that idea of a tailored and personalized um, feedback and assessment will support their engagement um, and their desire to want to be at university because they'll be learning more. And then it'll also support our staff in terms of our tutors. Um, the tutor's role will change from, uh, well, just in the example of marking, it'll change from having to mark um, every single assignment to a moderator. So basically it'll just be going through, making sure that um, the AI has provided adequate feedback um, and to give maybe some specific details if needed. So basically what we're seeing is that we can, one, reduce the teacher workload in terms of marking, and then to support our students um, to be flexible, to be dynamic in their learning, um, which is, you know, um, it will open up opportunities for diversity, equity and inclusion and hopefully belonging as well as students feel like the university system is responding to their needs. Another thing that we're going to be adding um, is the addition of a chatbot. So as students are moving through the content, if they have questions and they can't get a hold of a tutor or, you know, they're... Um, they're working after hours, then they'll be able to use this as well to provide feedback um, and get personalized um, learning in that context as well. Thank you. It was um, Dr. Rebecca um, Ramoni. I um, found it quite, quite interesting um, to hear um, their, their plans on applying um AI to help um differentiate learning in in that sense it's um an interesting example to think about differentiation and making learning more flexible at that level uh, and it reminds me of a um, presentation that was also part of it uh, Tech Week uh, with uh, Frances Valentine. She spoke about the possibilities in that space. But um, let's leave it there and come back to our panelists who are here in the in our room. And um, I wondered if we had any questions in the in the chat. Um, I I had a look through, but I couldn't really see um, many questions. But perhaps I missed some. Um, are there any comments that you as panelists would like to make? Shannon, is there anything you want to add or um, speak about in terms of what Mark said or Truman brought up? Recognizing you were the first to go, we could start that way. <laughs> or we can, of course, look for the for the questions first. I don't want to put you on the spot at all. Um, let's just have a quick look. No, thank you, Bettina. Um, I think it I think the thread that ran through everyone's corridor was that the rapid pace at which AI technology is is heading into is impacting education. And um, the the stories shared by both Truman um, and the other speakers 
about adapting and actually embracing what's happening with AI. And, and, and today, a lot of the talk has been about ChatGPT, but we know that AI technologies is more than just ChatGPT, but seeing how that um, is being used by education and strategies that are taking place that recognize, acknowledge that they're there and use it to challenge, um, challenge assessment practices um, I, I, I find that quite exciting and, and I hope that that is a commonality that we're seeing across not only universities but I'm interested to hear what that is looking like across um, secondary schools as well. Um, I just while I'm still sharing I am just seeing the questions come up and, and I see that someone said two speakers referred to hallucinations and yes. what did they mean. So um, often in chat, chat GPT as Mark shared um, it give it, ChatGPT provides us with responses or answers that sound very educated. They sound like factual and they're not. It's completely made up at times. It provides references so that if you don't um, not only have critical thinking, but the ability to go and fact check everywhere else. So you're also doing the work so that you know when something is accurate or not. Um, and ChatGPT is very good at generating these hallucinations so that you um, believe it to be true. Um, earlier I shared about the risk that we have around um, Māori sovereignty and um, you can have ChatGPT write karakia. You can have you can ask ChatGP to share about iwi whakapapa and it will make things up. Um, and I think I get excited by the sharing that Rebecca had around um, using AI to ease educators' workloads because we know that our educators um, have a lot on their plate. However, if we were to rely on what was coming out of ChatGPT and we were to use that as a source for uh, increasing our knowledge, there is a real risk that we will um, be distributing, sharing, increasing the misinformation that's out there. Um, so that's the threat of hallucinations from my perspective. And I'll hand over the mic to some of our other panelists. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, really appreciate it. I just quickly, I had a look at the questions that came through. Sorry, Mark and, and Truman. There was a question about the subject area of Dr. Marone. She's teaching in education. So um, that support field, um, we, we can look up her uh, profile that will have more information. Um, Mark and Truman, I'll let you go first and then we come back to the questions. And I've seen some questions um, from um, raised hands from Catherine Frost and other people. Mark, do you want to go first? Um, so yeah, just in chat, um, there were some people asking for our, yes. our this policy. So I shared this. I mean, this, but this is not a, this is not official university University of Auckland. This is our department within the faculty within the the university. Um, and I think university policy is that um, the policy uh, in terms of use of AI needs to be determined at a course level. So yes. it's up to the course and it's up to the course director to determine that. So even though we have a department policy, ultimately it's we can only encourage our course directors to use this particular policy. So I, I shared it there if it's of if, on chat, if it's of use to anybody. But yeah, just to follow up with the hallucinations. And um, the first time I came across that, it was a student answer. Uh, it was a chat GPT answer. It was a legal case, and I was like, "Wow, I've never heard of that case." But I had to actually go googling it to find if it was a real case. Now the problem is we have like a, a, you know on our first year courses, a, you know, a thousand two hundred students. And what happens then if we have to look up? you know, and check these references that we've never heard of. Um, I mean, the workload involved in that is just enormous, actually, if we've got to check everything out now. And so I think that, that is just a really huge challenge for us. So it's more just recognizing the challenge that is there, yeah. Mm, thank you, Mark. Adding workload at another level, <laughs> yeah. Truman, do you want to? Yep. Um, thank you, Bettina. Uh, I'd like to uh, answer also questions from Simon's because it's, it's similar to what I see across the uh, other three uh, speaker uh, and I have um, panelists. So we can see that um, uh, everyone here uh, um, try to balance and about um, 
the approach uh, to AI. We try to embrace AI, but we also try to uh, be responsible and, and mitigate the risks. So yes, it's not easy to, to, to strike a balance. Uh, there would be some errors, but trial and error is something we should do. But uh, in the long term, uh, if we approach uh, education in a holistic way, uh, we design assessment for actual learnings to make sure the learning happening for the students. And, and then I don't think we can, uh, we can be, we have to be afraid of the new technology. Today is ChatGPT, but tomorrow we may have other kind of um, uh, new generation of AI tools. So that is something we have to keep doing all the time. And we don't, I, I'm happy to see that no, uh, all the panelists also don't talk about the penalizing of people using AI in the wrong way because we should talk to people, we should work with people to address the issues, to fix the problems. Uh, penalizing people don't solve any problems. Does that answer your question, Simon? So this was Simon's question in the chat. Yep, that's right. Yeah, how institutions balance between the temptation to engage uh, with AI versus changing practices to avoid AI. There's a question from Tanya from the Open Polytechnic. Mark, will your slides be available? <laughs> sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, we we could maybe uh, put it um, together with the recording on the Flans website, but we can talk about it. What what suits you best? Okay. Well, what other questions do we have? There's quite a few coming um, now. Yes, Christina, Christina. Catherine has her hand raised, so right. let's get Thank to her. Thank you, Kevin. I'm Kia Koto, and thanks, Bettina and Christina. Um, uh, call Catherine Frost Tokawinga. Thank you to the panelists. It's been um, really interesting to listen to your korero, and thank you for that. Um, wanted to um, just maybe bring your attention to a couple of things. Um, and share. Uh, so I'm currently the lead writer for the technology learning area, which is being refreshed. Um, and I wanted to um, give the group a little bit of um, information around where the curriculum is, is trying to go to support this in schools. Um, so if you can imagine the, the curriculum like a sandcastle, I guess the curriculum part of it is like the flag that you push in the sandcastle. So it's the indicator of what should be done, um, what is the essential learning that can't be left to chance, and then the sandcastle itself is the local curriculum that the school develops um, according to the Arkonga and the community needs. So, so we're really the flag and the kind of the direction of what's essential and not left to chance. Um, so the technology learning area is currently so we're about halfway through the process so it will shift um, we are deliberately putting a focus on um, how we can raise awareness and guide uh, provide guidance for our conga and for Kura for schools um, in order to meet current and possible future needs so we've done this in a couple of ways one of the ways is that we're looking on a focus a big focus on ethics and responsibility which is inclusion um, designing for equity so the the deliberate um attention to what is really important and what can't let, can't be left to chance and we're pairing this with critical decision making so using practical and functional reasoning in order to ensure that um decisions are informed so i was having a quick quick giggle mark at your um your uh, around what you're doing with your university students because it's very very similar to what we're saying is appropriate from from year zero to year 13 across all the phases of learning about making sure that they're making critical decisions so that they can stand by what their uh, assumptions are or what they're uh, advocating for in terms of fit for purpose information so we're, we're phrasing this at the moment around the terms existing new and emerging technologies of course, we have to future proof this. We can't say AI and machine learning, for example, because we don't know in the next kind of few years or months even whether there's going to be significant shifts around that. So um, if there's anybody on the group who wishes to provide any feedback or support as to what that could be or what your uh, views are, um, please get in touch. Um, CatherineFrostEducation.govt.nz. Um, 
So yes, it is being addressed. The minister is the ministry is addressing um, AI in order to provide guidance to schools. Um, so hopefully, um, we should see a lot more of that um, being positioned as we hope it should be. Um, the last bit of information, I guess, um, which I think sets us apart from other jurisdictions. Um, most jurisdictions, for example, um, in Australia, both curriculum and a lot of policy focus around technology as the thing, as a disparate uh, thing from people. Um, we have a real socio-technology stance in Aotearoa, which is absolutely unique in terms of um, the positioning of curriculum of other countries. So what that means is that we look at how technology relates to people and how people relate to technology. And it's through the lens of the socio-technology that, um, that we address this. And my personal view is that's possibly the, the best uh, approach and likely to have the best results for us as a country. So um, some reassurance and yes, this is being addressed. And if anybody wishes to um, provide any feedback, um, then it would be very welcomed. So, um, Kira, thanks again to the speakers. Very useful. Thank you so Thank much, you Catherine. Time. Thank you. Um, we have a few more comments, but I'm also mindful of Navid having his hand up. And I'm not sure if there are other people in the room who have their hand up. So um, let's go to Navid first and then come back to some of the questions. And then we actually need to wrap up soon. Um, yeah, Marina. Yeah, Marina. Everyone, I'm Navid from Southern Institute of Technology in Cargill. Uh, mainly an engineer, but have a passion in app development and especially artificial intelligence these days. And I really appreciate all the speakers for sharing their ideas on how they're engaging AI for the benefit of the learners in the teaching staff. And I love the way the University of Auckland is embracing AI. Is what Mark said. We can't stop learners using that. Uh, my comment is more like a value addition to this webinar, probably, than a question, and I hope you won't find that. Uh, talking about the ideas from Rebecca, it might be interesting for you guys to see that we have already unofficially started testing one of an in-house uh, build tool that generates instant feedback for learner submissions. Uh, at the moment, it's not integrated with the Blackboard, but we are looking forward to do some integrations like that. And results are sometimes hallucinating. I would say eight out of 10 are good, but two, uh, they, are, they are a bit weird, um, but we are improving it. And uh, we're also using it for checking the references, referencing formats, which takes a lot of time. So that can be automated. Um, for the brainstorming part, we have also made, and we are testing another tool, which is for generating the mind maps. And so far our business students in the engineering learners uh, he found it quite interesting, and I think making more tools like that will help our learners taking their ideas to another great level. Um, I'm happy to share those links in the chat, and we'll appreciate if there is any feedback on that. So thank you all. Thank you once again. Thank you for, for sharing um, those practices. And I, I know that um, there was one more point about uh, Rebecca's um, presentation where um, the, the the poster asked um, what is the stance of the panelists on adaptive assessment and and how what would be the benefits of that possibly but I think we're running out of time we probably need a follow-up <laughs> webinar so I also want to acknowledge that there are quite a few posts that that I didn't get to um, thank you everybody for your for your messages and posts I just feel we probably have to wrap up here um, Unfortunately, we don't have a 90 minute webinar for this. <laughs> and um, if that's okay, I would like to close us with a karikia. But first of all, thank you to our speakers. Thank you so much um, for sharing your, your concerns and questions and strategies. Um, it is really appreciated um, because we're all really in this together trying to work out how to go forward um, with having a lens of inclusiveness and looking at us as a country, being Aotearoa or New Zealand, um, you know, there are solutions for us um, that we need to find. So I'm just going to close us off with a karikia. Po hihiri, po rarama, po o te whakaro, po o te tangata, po o te aroha, te po ihiri nai i tato, Māori ora ki a tato, humie, huie, tākie. 
Thank you again for everybody for joining us.